Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm super excited. We got Bill Dolan in the house. I'm really excited, man. I'm looking forward to learning from Mr. Bill Dolan. So, welcome, 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 welcome to the show, everybody. Oh, man, I like those moves. Yeah, I've been working. I've been working on it for a long time, and they still aren't getting any better. Oh man, you hey, you're good at it. You're good at it. How are you doing today? I am doing so well today. Crazy well today. Thanks, Tony. It's just a delight to be here. Uh, thank you. So for everybody that's that's out there listening, I'm trying something different. I'm I'm trying some music in the background. If it's obnoxious, mm -hmm. let me know. If you can hear it, let me know. If it's a good, if it's at a good level, let me know. Um, so. Again, welcome to Leaders Lead, the podcast. I got Mr. Bill Dolan on here. I was looking at Mr. Bill Dolan's resume, and I'm just like, man, that's a lot. That's a lot of stuff to read, man. He's so freaking accomplished. So I went to his LinkedIn bio, and this is what I got. Mr. D Mr. Bill Dolan is Emmy-nominated TV and virtual event director, over 10,000 productions, video producer, live and virtual events, author, mastermind coach, 7DRM, the disciplines of relationship marketing, and he is a keynote speaker. Everybody welcome Mr. Bill Dolan. Woo. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me, Tony. Thank you. We got people already saying hi to you, man. We got a really good um, community here I on the leaders. leaders Lead the Podcast. We got a really good community. So uh, tell us a, a bit about yourself. Well, I, I appreciate the intro. And, you know, uh, and it sounds big to say, oh, you did this and you did this and you did this. You know, there's uh, rather than say, oh, my goodness, what a crazy resume. What a, all these accomplishments. Let's look at the reality. Number one was uh, why did I get the resume? We'll just answer that really simply. I kept doing it. <laughs> I just kept doing it. You know, I, I think like a lot of us, we start somewhere. And before I became great at my, my craft, I was good at my craft. Before I was good at my craft, I was fair at my craft. And before I was fair at my craft, I was really bad at my craft. But I kept working at it because I did have a dream. I did have a passion. I did have a seed of aptitude. And when you keep doing it and you keep pressing and you keep pressing at the end of the day and at the end of a journey, and I'm certainly not the end of the journey, I'm still in the middle of a journey. All of a sudden a resume starts to develop and people go, wow, what do you attribute that to? I kept going. I kept going no matter what the, the difficulty, no matter the disappointment, no matter the failure, no matter the times I spent on my face crying or the mm. times that I looked up to the heavens and said, God, is this really what you want for me? Um, but I kept pressing on. And uh, and that's really what that resume represents. It's, it's nothing really more than the willingness that all of us have inside of us to press on, even in the midst of of crisis in the hardest journey you might ever have press man, on man i love that that's that's beautiful and that's why i bought you on man i bought you on because of your incredible your incredible story i was looking at some of the things that not only that you've done but the things that you've been to through and i was just immediately i was like damn like wow wow you you had a breakthrough moment um how, how long ago was that breakthrough moment? Well, it's just about been about 20 years. I mean, I've had many breakthrough moments, and, and, frankly, and I think most of us will have breakthrough moments. Uh, sometimes you recognize them and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to get past them to go, oh, my gosh, that was a big time. I just didn't realize it. But I, I'm sure you're referring to the day I died. Yeah. And that was when I think about breakthrough moments it was one of the greatest breakthrough moments I could ever hope for. And, you know, right up there with uh, marrying my high school sweetheart or becoming a father and having my family, um, it is truly one of the greatest um, experiences I've ever had in my life and one that I'm incredibly thankful for. The, the experience of, of you dying? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. How, how, how is that? That's incredible. Well, you know, 
let me okay i'll give you the context i'll give you the story okay so you have your little context because if you look at that resume you know that i've been in the business a long time i'm not a kid i've been doing i've been working the television the entertainment space you know now a lot of virtual events which is really interactive internet television so i do that for corporations and and entertainment today and and we've got projects with netflix and nasa and all the type of things going on now you know so i'm still just giddy with what's ahead and the things we're working on but when i started in my career i was a studio director for uh the abc or the regional abc station in in our area and and uh Man, I, I just loved it. I love, love, loved it. It was like heaven to me because I got to do one, something that was really cool, really fun, something that I turned out to be good at and I loved, which is fabulous when you get that combination. And I was surrounded by brilliant people, great directors, um, uh, great talent, great artists, great agency people. And I was just a sponge, and I still am a sponge when I'm around. I was just at a meeting earlier today with this brilliant writer, and we're collaborating on this on this project. And I was just feeling a sense of intense gratitude that when you're around talented people, um, if at all possible, shut up and listen. Oh. Absorb it. You don't have to prove anything to the world simply become the best you can be. And the best you can be is that be that student. And that's what I was. My first 12 years in live broadcast, I was a student and, and I was so blessed to learn. But I'd married my high school sweetheart. I, I, I mentioned that. It's one of my great things in life. And and uh, we wanted to start a family. So I was like, well, okay, how are we going to make ends meet? And so I uh, began looking alternative ways to kind of make some money on the side. thought, okay, I can make this work. And I, I, I tried um, multi-level marketing for a little bit and I was horrible. And I mean, horrible with a capital H, horrible at it. And I did that <laughs> with the most respect for multi-level marketing, the right product, the right model. Great. But I was bad at it. And then someone said, well, you should do financial planning and maybe that'll be a good thing for you since you seem to have a good head for business, kind of. And uh, and I th so I got my securities license and I was horrible at it. I mean, <laughs> so bad. I mean, really, it was just, it was not a good thing. And, and I learned a little bit, not only about aptitudes, but also passions. And that I had been working in a field for which I had aptitude and passion. And now I was trying to do something on the side for which I really did not have passion and I didn't have aptitude. But it was a gateway to allow me to continue to fail forward into someone asking me if I could help them produce live events. Because they said, wait, you're a director. Maybe you could help us do some live events. And and it turns out that producing a live event, like a live show. And th this was know, before like COVID and all of that, right? Oh, way, way before that. Yeah, this is okay. a long, long time ago. And uh, um, it just was a natural for me. And it turned into being a very viable business that actually started our, our corporation. And then when I left TV, which I will say also, it wasn't a ceremonious event where I said, I'm done here and I'm moving on to great things. No, it was like, I was working so hard that I was emotionally exhausted. And I had an episode where a writer crossed me and said the wrong thing. And I decided that the best thing to do was to help him down to the floor. And wait, uh, you, you decked him? Yeah, and it's ever so gently. Enough, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, enough that one, that's not me. It's really not me. Yeah. But it was an exposure that sometimes when we're just pressing ourselves and pressing ourselves and not understanding healthy boundaries, which I was not about healthy boundaries. I was all about blowing up boundaries. Um, I found out that not only did I have it was in a situation to hurt myself, but to hurt others. And I ended up getting fired from my dream job. Wow. Walking out of a television station at really kind of the pinnacle of, of my career. And figuring out how am I going to make this work? And after saying a prayer, <laughs> apologizing to my wife and saying, I'm going to do whatever I can to make this thing work. 
our business went from a part-time kind of thing that was a side hustle, literally explode into an incredible opportunity that sent me around the world to work wow. with some of the biggest names in television, biggest names in there. It just like blew me away. Um, but I still struggle with boundaries and I like to push, push, push. And I push so much in my career um, that I also turned my back on being the best father I could be and the best husband I could be. I mm. thought it meant showing up, you know, having a paycheck, having a nice home to live in and, and go to private schools and all that stuff. You know what? But the, 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 what I was not to my kids and my wife all the time was present. And I mean, present emotionally, present mentally, present spiritually. I was present financially. And I was present at all the things you show up for. But I was oblivious to what my family really needed. And it was right around 1999 that I was just starting to get a clue. And I had an opportunity to produce a documentary project. And documentaries are fun because you pour yourself into it. And potentially you get mailbox money because you get residuals if you find a distribution partner. And I was very blessed to not only produce a, a documentary project that I was proud of, but I found a distribution partner out of Nashville. And they wow. said, you fly to Nashville, boom, we want to write you a big check. And it's the first of a lot of residuals because this thing's going to take off and uh, just get here. We've got papers to sign and boom, that's it. So January 28th, 1999, I hopped on a plane from Portland, Oregon, with my best friend, Timothy Greenwich. Timothy, who was on his way to Nashville also. He's one of the best gospel singers in the world. And a giant guy. Giant guy. He looks like an NFL player. And, and me, you know, I'm kind of an Irish leprechaun-ish type of figure. So and, he's a, and he's a gospel singer? He's a gospel singer. Yeah. Oh, so good. So good. And we traveled and we did a lot of shows together. We still do. We work together all the time. And, uh, but he's with me and I get on that flight knowing that day with a kind of a sense of, man, today's the day I am, my life's going to change today. Today, I'm going to get that check. I'm going to sign that contract. My whole career is going to explode in a new way. So I get on that plane and I take off and about 20 minutes into the flight, I started to feel funny. And I couldn't put my finger on it. Like I was sick, but I'm never, ever, 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 ever sick. And, um, I remember, um, feeling like things were closing in on me. So I, um, I finally turned to Timothy and I said, Tim, I said, something's not right. And that's the last thing I said. And my eyes just rolled back in my head and my arms flopped by my side and my heart stopped. Wow. In midair. 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 And uh, um, Tim didn't know CPR officially or anything. Like he'd seen it. And interestingly enough, about two weeks prior to this, he had seen a guy actually have a heart attack. Now, I didn't have a heart attack, but I guess it, what I experienced looked kind of like it. So he knew right away something was wrong. And he uh, immediately grabbed me and he started doing chest compressions. And he was beating me and, you know, trying to get me go and nothing happened. So he picks me up and he puts me in the aisle and he starts doing the chest compressions and doing the whole bit. And, uh, and he said, nothing was happening. Just nothing was happening. And he said, he, he pulled up his fist, clinched his fist and he pulled back and he said, I was ready to break your ribs. Wow. And as he pulled, which he easily could do. And as he was about to swing forward, I took a breath. Wow. And the crazy thing is, is that while he, what he experienced was probably, I don't know, two, three minutes of like, ah, you know, mid-flight horror, trying to deal with this, this body and bring his buddy back to life. I could have been gone for two three million years because I remember everything. And it was the idea of not just having my heart stop, 
but literally crossing the threshold from this dimension into eternity. Wow. And it literally blew up my mind and my understanding. Um, blew up my paradigms. It completely blew up my paradigms. So that when I came back from that. So and, whether, whether that, sorry to interrupt you, whether that, that looked like, like in that moment. Mm, the death part? Yeah. Well, like, was it really like lights and stuff like that? Like everybody's yeah. saying? Or? Yeah. Now, I for, first, let me give you a little context. I recognize that a lot of people have unique experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not like we all just entered the same Starbucks. And, you know, no. it's not like that. Um, for me, literally the, the second I, I closed my eyes, mm -hmm. it's as, I felt transported into the dimension of eternity. I can't tell you it was heaven. I can't tell you where it was. There were no signage identifying where I was. And uh, God bless those people that can figure that out. <laughs> I, I, no signage. I like it. <laughs> not, not like that. But this is what I did now is that in that second, I came face to face with God. Wow. And for me, my experience with God was not like this human form type of thing that I kind of imagined as a kid. Instead, I was literally consumed with the presence of God. It's as if it was like a 360 degree completely enveloping of the presence of the divine. Um, but more so than being abundantly clear that I was in the presence of God, it's that I realized I was in the presence of love. Not just like a loving environment. I was in the presence of the embodiment of love, the author of love, the expression of love in totality. And it's interesting. Now, I'll say I grew up in a semi-religious home, more very, 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 very traditional and somewhat even kind of oppressive. Um, uh, you know, there's 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 a, 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 a scripture that says that that God created us in his image. But I am thoroughly convinced that most of us create God in our image. Ooh. And the box we love to put God in gives us comfort, gives us control gives us a level of definition because if we had the if we had the the choice of knowing or not knowing most of us say well I'd rather know and some of us sometimes are willing to accept something even though they don't know that they know that they know because they'd rather land somewhere than be in a place of discovery and for me I can tell you that the the environment I grew up with was all about definition. This is this, this is this. And when you try to put God in this or this or this or this, get ready to have your box blow up. Wow. And then my box blew up because not only did I come face to face with the embodiment of pure love, it's as if I could look to the right and as far as I could see or even feel was the presence of the divine in the eternal overwhelming love I was, I was feeling. And if I turn to the left, same thing. If I look up, if I look down. But probably um, the most profound thing for me is, was as if like a laser beam went through my head. It's like... It's like I just got it. And I can tell you that when um, I was little, and I remember um, hearing a quote uh, that was uh, someone asked Jesus, said, Jesus, what's the most, the greatest commandment? You know? And he said, Love the Lord your God. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your mind and your strength. And then love your neighbor like you love yourself. And I remember hearing that. And just between us here. <laughs> just, was, just, yeah. us. just us. Just me and you. <laughs> and, just, uh, you. and I've said this before, you know, so if someone's heard me, I mean, please forgive me. That might sound sacrilegious, but 
I thought that was one of the most arrogant thing God commands you could ever have. Yeah. And the reason I thought it was arrogant is I thought, look, if God's God, why does God always go, worship me, love me? What are, it just seems so selfish and self-centered. It, it kind of blew me away. Like, why would you do that? Yeah. But then I got it. That God asks us to love him with all our heart and our soul, and our mind, and our strength. Because that's how much God loves us. God loves you with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. And the embodiment of love created relationship as the perfect expression of love. So even as he loves you, he's saying, Love me that way. And this is the perfect embodiment of relationship. And then the way that is expressed in the divine dimension is expressed in this dimension. Because I want you to love you the way I love you. And if you can love you the way I love you, you will have the capacity to love others in a way that you never thought possible. And that's the principle that I write about in my book called 360 Degree Love. Because it's no longer just a, an act. It is literally a complete expression. And the knowledge that God is not just a God. He doesn't just know you. God's the greatest cheerleader. Who's cried every tear, hoped every hope, dreamed every dream right next to you. And I doubted that most of my life until I came face to face. And now I know I can not only does God love me, not only does God love you, but you can trust it. Even though um, I will argue with how it's going or why it's going or when it's going, because God doesn't just treat us like pawns, you know, moving us around. We co-write, we co-author our life with the divine. And a lot of stuff we blame God for, it's really our fault. It's just stupid stuff we do. So if it feels good to blame God, have at it. Um, God still loves you. It's still okay. But it's going to be our choice to how we have that relationship with God, with ourselves, with others. And now the choices we make in this world, and especially I think about this program, for those of us who have been called to lead, and what does that look like? Man, that's, that's beautiful, Bill. I, I got to say, man, I'm going to toot my own horn here. <laughs> <laughs> I bring the best guest on these show on this show, man. Mm -hmm. I have not had one show, man, where I haven't mm -hmm. broken a tear, man. Listening to your story, man, is so freaking inspiring. Mm -hmm. And if you're not inspired by mm -hmm. listening to Bill's story, there's no freaking hope. <laughs> there's no, I don't know what else is is gonna do it, man. That is that is so incredible. I mean, you came face to face with God himself. I can't imagine what your, your frame of mind must be now when someone tells you that, you know, Hey, you didn't get that deal or um, maybe you have to, to, to work a little bit later. Like did that change that had to change your perspective, right? Oh. Forgive me if I'm being presumptive. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, you know, let's be honest. I'm still a guy. And you know, I love to tell you that that experience was like a light switch. And it's like, boom, the light goes on. And now my life changed. No, I'm still a goofball. I still make mistakes. I still have echoes of lies in my head from my childhood or, or hurts or pains or disappointments, you know, and things that you need to work through. And that's the beauty is that um, you can take an experience like that and say, how will that change you? How will that change your trajectory? And how do 
you use those insights to shape not only uh, what you think, but who you are and what you're becoming. And that's been a 20 year process. I mean, it happened 20 years ago. I did not write my book, The Seven Disciplines of Relationship Marketing, um, really until 2019. And I think I released, yeah, the, uh, the print copy like in January, 2021. So this is a fairly new thing for me to get to the point where, yeah, I'm willing to share this, but even more important, share how that applied to my business. Because here's the thing that's crazy is that while the divine and the spiritual aspect of our life is so, 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 so powerful, what we forget is that it's also so crazy practical. And that idea of when you talk about relationship, relationship with the divine, relationship with yourself, relationship with others. If I just took that and made it a spiritual experience I had in my closet with a, you know, a jar of incense and a candle, you know, <laughs> um, I would have robbed the world of the very intention of what relationship is about. And that's where I start thinking about my business. I mean, I grew up in media. We've had the privilege of, of doing programs for millions and millions of people. But it made me ask myself, what role am I playing in making a difference in those lives? How am I using media, whether it be for a small group or a profound number of people? And am I actually making a difference in a positive way? And it started shaping a little bit of time our clients, our projects, and then the way we did it. And that was probably the biggest breakthrough because, I, I mean, I joke, if, if, if you die and you don't get a little spiritual, I mean, there's something wacky going on. And for me, I went back to some of my roots. And keep in mind, I, I've always tried to be very open-minded and, and try to understand how people believe and their philosophies and things like that. And so I, I've try to learn and understand that. And I certainly major, major fan of the great philosophers, you know, the Aristotles and the Plato's and mm -hmm. you know, I, I, those were all my humanities credits in college with studying philosophy. Um, and, uh, but I went back to kind of the hero of my, my youth uh, faith and that was Jesus. And now that I'd had this encounter, I wanted to go back I actually wanted to read Jesus' life, but I wanted to strip away um, all the accoutrements because I think we had, we love to attach a lot of things to different faiths and belief systems. And I just wanted to read what he said and what he did. That's yeah. all I did. That's all I did. And when I did strip it just down to that, who's this guy, when he was born, and then I started looking at the science around it, the archaeology of it. And then I started looking at the what I call the historicity, what I call it. It's not me calling it. But I had to ask this question. Is what no, we, get, we give you credit for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> it, is, this, is this relatively accurate? Now, granted, there's a lot of books in history that, you know, we know they change over time. But here's the thing that blew me away was that a lot of times when they talk about historical documents, they ask the question, how accurate could it be? And one of the measurements is, is how many original documents can they find from it from the time it was originally written? And how long was it? Right. Was it 30 years, 100 years, 1,000 years? How long was it? And a lot of the great documents refer to, even the great philosophers, you know, hundreds of years before we find any original documents writing about it. In the case of the original writings about the documentation of Jesus, there was like a 29-year gap between the time it happened and the time that we start seeing original writings. So that's pretty good. The second thing is how many copies of it can we find? And in the case of those particular writings, there's tens of thousands of copies, tens of thousands that- that Are you talking about like original copies or no, copies no, no, of no, the copy? Copies of the copies, okay? okay. Yeah. So then they go, okay. But then the next thing is how much do they match, okay? because over time things will change. And so besides the fact that it was written pretty close, there were tens of thousands of copies, they had over 95% match. 
over 2,000 years of documentation. So from a rule of historicity, just those four books about Jesus are some of the most historically accurate books in the history of ancient writings. So that, okay, I can read about this. Then I started reading about archaeology and the stuff they're finding out. And that's when it blew up for me. And this is where I got a lot of pushback from people of faith who profess to follow Jesus. Because I looked at Jesus, I said, do you know who he is? He's the greatest marketer in the history of mankind. <laughs> the greatest marketer? <laughs> the greatest <laughs> marketer in history. I mean, you could give a bunch of other titles, and I respect all those titles. But what jumped out at me was this this is person is brilliant. And I started writing out and I reverse engineered the whole marketing process. Yeah. What he did, when he did it, everything. And then I started looking at all my clients, my Nikes and my Adidas's and my Microsoft's. And I went, holy crud. Even Lady Gaga. They oh wow, you work with all those people? Well, I haven't worked I've worked with all those people. I haven't worked with Lady Gaga, but I've worked with like Maroon 5 and Gwen Stefani and and uh, Black Eyed Peas. I've worked with all these different bands and stuff. And when you look at some of these great careers, they have marketed that way. This is what have made them so powerful because they marketed a very specific model. Hmm. Now they might not look at it and go, Oh, that's the Jesus model. No, they market it because it's a brilliant model. And it's a model that whether you're a coach or whether you're a multi-billion dollar company, the seven disciplines that I saw practiced were the foundation of not only great marketing, but of creating movements. Wow. And that's what I started to write down. And that's what I started to practice with my clients. And that's when I went, the light went on. There's something really, really powerful here. And it, and I just say at the center of it, it's a relationship. So is it is that in the do you cup do you cover this in your book? I'm asking because I'm gonna read it now, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. do. Yeah. It's actually, I mean, I I finally wrote it, you know, and it is the whole thing's in the book. I talk about my death experience, I go into more details, I talk about my career, I talk about, you know. Times I work with President Clinton, or I worked with this this act, or this this act, or I learned this thing, and I and uh, but then I talk about these disciplines and what they look like applied, and in it actually is um, you know spoiler alert, um, yeah I can tell you, go ahead yeah it's I I I managed the and developed the campaign to launch the Obama Winter White House, and it was a real estate development we got hired to 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 promote and we blew it up. We use the seven disciplines, boom, 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 boom. We blew it up into a campaign that went global and uh, ended up tra attracting uh, the Obamas actually to move into this estate for their, for their holidays. And we leveraged that into a multinational multimedia campaign that ended up becoming very successful for our client. And, uh, and I tell that story of how that unfolded in the book. Wow. So you work with the Obamas? <laughs> well, <laughs> That's crazy, man. Yeah. Gwen <laughs> Stefani. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> dude, that is freaking amazing. And I, I love the, um, the, the principle that you oh. use and you connect that with, with faith. That's, that's interesting. That, that brings about spirit media, right? Wow, yeah. I get it. You're a giver. I can tell, right? Uh, well, I pray I am. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, yeah. Guess, I guess the quality of the giver in a lot of ways has to do with whether anybody wants the gift and and uh, uh, whether they're ready to receive the gift. You know, um, I look, I, you know, when you talk about leadership and you talk about writing or giving or things like that, I'm reminded, and those people that know me well know that I love to bake. And I love to bake cookies. It's actually how I got my job in television is through cookies. That's, another, <laughs> that's cool, man. That's, that's, that's another story. But, you know, I'm reminded if, if you believe that you bake good cookies, 
and you can trust you bake good cookies. Then you accept that as, as you are accepting the call to bake those cookies, it is now your call to share those cookies. But recognize that there's some people, one, that don't like cookies. Or maybe they're not hungry right now. Or maybe, for me, one of my favorites is oatmeal chocolate chip. Maybe. I hate oatmeal chocolate chip. Are you serious? I hate them. Oh, oh. man. I think they're just, I can't eat them, dude. I, I would eat, I would rather eat like asparagus or something. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and, man. And that's a perfect example because I know my cookies are good. But I know there's some people that don't like that cookie. My mother-in-law used to make some good ones. That does an exception to some. Maybe yours would be different. <laughs> well, we're gonna okay. We're gonna have to share cookies. Yeah, we'll have to share some cookies. But that's the thing is that you know that if if your cookies are good, and you share your cookies, some people don't need cookies, and some people don't like that flavor, and that's okay. The idea, uh, really, is to be faithful to share the cookies. And try to become really good at making cookies. So when we do that as leaders, we model that. That means, yes, we're going to fall flat on our face. We're going to make mistakes. Um, but part of it, and this is the, the art of relationship and the heart of relationship, is we give. And that's kind of the trigger. What you said is about giving. We give because we genuinely care and we genuinely love. Wow. And that's we don't stuff. get hurt if it's not received, but we're faithful to give because that's our calling. That's, that's the breath of life that each one of us receive every day that we can now use to be a blessing to others. Wow. That's, that's amazing. I, um, I asked you that because um, I don't, I don't even remember who it was, what day it was, but I saw a post, I was scrolling through LinkedIn and somebody said, Oh, my, my mentor, Bill Dolan is so freaking amazing. It was something like that. And they attacked you in, in it. And I was like, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Like that's, that's really cool that you have mentees that are shouting mm. you out like that. And then I, um, and then I took a deep dive in your work and your videos. And I'm just like, man, crushing on you. Like, man, this dude is, is, is deep. And I saw this story about you actually you know leaving leaving the earth mm. and transcending and coming back and i was just like mm. i have to talk to this man because for me like when people see my show they think that it's a show where we're going to talk about corporate leadership we're going to talk about you know how to get the people to work and all of that no <laughs> i'm talking about uh, the i should probably change the name because i don't want to be deceiving this has not it's like it has nothing to do with business a little to do with business but more to do was what's in here and i feel like leaders leaders lead from uh within and just to see that you're mentoring and there's actually uh people out there that's, that are saying oh man he's an amazing mentor i i thought that that was was big especially in a space right now i'm not sure if you're aware but there's there's people out there that out here, like so-called gurus, uh, they're paying thousands and thousands and thousands for for to mentor people, mm. and they don't really get anything back in in return. It sounds like like you're different. Well, I I guess I, I mean I don't know how how to respond quite. I mean I'm humbled that someone goes wow you know that I'm a mentor. If if anything, it's it's um. It reminds me of, of uh, a hero of mine, uh, Stan Lee. Oh, by the way, you see one of his creations back there, uh, Iron Man. And and when he was creating... Wait, is that that? Wow, that's cool. Yeah, we got Iron Man back here in the studio here. Um, and, <laughs> and, and, he's, and he's here reminding me, not only, I mean, he's from a show we did. And so I, I scored on the props. So I love Iron Man. But you look at that. that you're, a, you're a fascinating guy, Bill. <laughs> that is so cool. Oh, hey, sometime <laughs> when you're in the neighborhood, I'll bring you to the studio because when, you know, there's a lot more going on here than we where, show on camera. Are you still in Oregon? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, dude. Yeah. I'm, I'm right down the street from you. You're, you're, I'm you're in, my uh, I-5 neighbor. Yeah, I'm in I'm Olympia. I might have to take you up on, on that, man. Bang, we're two hours apart. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's crazy. We're we're really close. I mean, we're so close that I've been to 
to schools in Portland before and elected to um, to drive instead of stay in a hotel. So yeah, we're we're super close. That's great. You got Iron Man behind you. All right, but go. go ahead. Well, yeah, I mean, that's amazing. Well, you think about Stan and Stan passed away, and uh, um, such a fascinating man. But one of his sayings that I really, really appreciated so much, and it really, for those of you that are fans in the entertainment space or storytelling, this is one of uh, the pieces behind Stan's brilliance was he wanted everybody to know that inside every flawed human being is a superhero waiting to emerge. And it was such an important message that if you look at his characters, they're flawed. They could have family problems, physical problems, emotional problems, self-doubt, fear, discouragement. These are the things that every human being experiences. And the trouble with it, I, I think it's still cool to call it leadership because guess what? What we need to do is pull the BS out of leadership that says, yes. I'm perfect and I'm tough and I know all the answers. No, the world is made up of people. And uh, in the idea of someone trying to become a great leader or aspire to be a great leader starts with not just getting a title, but becoming. Mm -hmm. And what does becoming look like? It's being able to look in the mirror every day and say, are you ready to lead the most difficult subject in the world? And that's you. You. Oh, <laughs> that's good. That's you good. Know, can you rise True. to that? And when you learn to rise to that, it means that you have to accept the, the baggage that comes with it. That, yeah, I am flawed. I am learning. I am becoming. I am on a journey. I'm not the same day, same person I was yesterday as I am today. But I had to make choices to make sure I'm a different and a better person tomorrow. And what will that journey look like? And so ultimately, a leader is someone that's very actively and deliberately on that journey in such a way that others say, I want to go on that journey too. Because I'm not just here to follow you. A great leader helps people become the best versions of themselves. And they live it and they model it every day. And... Like Iron Man, sometimes we put on the armor. Sometimes we need it. Yeah. But inside is the heart. And that still is the most purest, important part of who we are. And when we can peel back those layers, instead of hiding that heart and reveal that heart, I think that is one of the, one of the keys to becoming not only a great person, but a great leader. Oh, dude, that's that is good. That is some good stuff. When I say good stuff, anybody that's listening to this right now, if you're not writing this down, man, I encourage you. Wait, nah, don't go get a pen. Watch it again. Watch it. <laughs> share it. Share it with somebody. Tag somebody. This is this is good stuff, man. This is really, really good stuff, man. I am so inspired by you. I know I keep saying that because it is the absolute truth. It's um it's been a pleasure talking to you. Gonna been a pleasure getting to know you, man. And I'm like I said, I'm fascinated by you. I'm a big fan. Um, if there's anything that I can ever assist with with leaders lead the podcast or just anything, let me know. I mean, if you want somebody to babysit the Iron Man suit in the back, fine. Uh, <laughs> let me know. Yeah. It's pretty fun to wear it. I it's too big for me. But I'll tell you, when people wear it. They feel pretty strong. It's People pretty put, you could put that sucker on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was used for a show. It was designed for, uh, um, we had it custom made for a guy that was six foot four. And uh, everything down to the fingertips were custom made. And uh, yeah, there's, I, I remember the day he put it on and he transformed in front of our eyes and kind of way a lot of us can do when we put on, put on the armor. Oh, I love that. That is that is super good. Um, what can my audience, the viewers, the listeners, because they will on LinkedIn, YouTube, iTunes, I can keep going on and on. But uh, how can our listeners and viewers support support you? Um, is there do you want them to go and check out the book? What is it? Well, it's, it, it's I guess, you know, but I guess it's time to offer the cookies. You know, and it's, please, it's, please, it's, it's, man, it's you're giving us so much. 
Look, some people want my cookies and some people don't even like the cookies. I totally get that. I am I am, a, I am like chocolate chip oatmeal that some people hate. Yeah. <laughs> like Tony, which we're going to have to go into therapy for that one, boy. <laughs> but, no, I would say that if if the idea of becoming a great leader in and and even the idea of if you're a small business emerging business, or you're part of a marketing department you say look i'm tired of just doing it the same old way and i want to break through and i want clarity in what my marketing looks like but a way that is true to you that is true to your brand that isn't a, that isn't just throwing on the armor and looking pretty but to do something that's authentic and what i call integrity based marketing quick note integrity comes from the same word we get integer. In other words, it's a whole number. In other words, the face you put here, it's a face you put here, it's a face you put here, it's a face you put here. And understanding what that is and how it can express it the best, um, I would highly encourage you, go ahead, get the, get the book. It's on Amazon, I have it on the, the, the book and I have the Kindle, I have the Audible, it's great. And if you- Do you uh, read it yourself? Yeah, I read it myself. Awesome. So in other words, you get this crazy voice through the whole thing. So <laughs> awesome. And I and I share my heart. And I'll be honest with you, there's parts where I get choked up. I mean, when I really tell my story and tell you what happened and tell you what you can experience and recognize the greatness that is really in you, um, it will choke all of us up. When you recognize that even this day, and it's something I'm abundantly aware of because, because of my heart thing, I was given a pacemaker. Now, just the cardiologist today, I'm, I'm having a replacement put in because my battery is getting low. So I'm slated to have heart surgery here in, in um, a couple weeks. And wow. when I do, it's, I go in there with a certain sense of respect for the science of it. And a certain amount of reverence also that today when I got up, today when you got up, you took a breath. And the truth is that I didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. It was a gift. It was a precious gift. And when I recognize with gratitude the gift I have to have breath today, the question you ask is how will I use that breath? to be a gift to others. What will you do today? And how will you use this gift to make a difference in the world? And it doesn't have to be profound, but if all of us recognize that and use that and get back to relationship again, because it's the most precious thing we have with each other, I think we can literally change the world um, in more ways than you could imagine. So if, so if someone comes back and they say, look, I, I want to read the book, I am going to break out for the very first time. I'm going to do a workshop for people that want to work with me. And I'm going to roll it out this uh, fourth quarter. Hmm. So if someone says, I'm interested, get in touch with you, DM me. Um, you could reach out to our production manager, Kelly, at spiritmedia.com. I'm going to be interviewing some people where we're going to beta test it. And I'm going to personally work with people to help them through the seven disciplines to help them transform their marketing for clarity, for breakthrough. But more important, I want to be able to help people become the world changers they were called to be. And I think together, I'm just giddy with what we can do. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. Get on that. Reach out to, to Bill Dole and reach out to myself and uh, I will put you in contact with him and we'll make it happen. You're trying to transform some leaders. I love that. I love the, the seven the, the seven disciplines in relationship with, with marketing. That is really cool. We're going to teach you how to market like Jesus today. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, I love it. It's been a pleasure. Um, hang out really quick in the green room and uh while I close up and yeah, man, I just want to say thank you. I say the green room like it's all fancy and stuff. It I'm is just... fancy. I'll <laughs> tell you, it's the coolest green room I've yeah. been in today. Uh, I love it. It's so cool. 
I love it. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, and Tony. I really appreciate you. I like from the bottom of my heart, this has been, I knew it was going to be good, but this is way better than expected. 100 and a thousand percent. I, man, I really appreciate it. You got a friend of me, brother. Thank you. Thank you. And likewise, we're friends for life. And we definitely know we're that close. We're going to be hanging out. All right. I remember you said that. Forget my next live, I'm going to be wearing the Iron Man suit. I don't know yeah. if I can fit it, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Oh my god, that was super good. I think I like did I hang up on you? No, I'm here. I'm in the All right. room. All right, good, good. Yeah, I'm just out here drinking the Chi Chi drinks you set out for me. It's so cool. <laughs> All right, good, good, good. Enjoy it. <laughs> All right, y'all. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate all the support, all the love that we have been given. Um, I'm looking at the reviews and I'm noticing a common thread. You guys are leaving them. That is super, 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 super important for you to leave the reviews. And I appreciate everything that you all are saying. And if there's somebody that you want to see on the show, you want to hear on the show, please let me know. Um, today, Mr. Bill Dolan was extraordinary. He was extraordinary. And uh, that's, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep doing this. I want to keep getting people like him on the show. Uh, this afternoon, we have Ahmad Ayman on the show. And his story is incredible. He didn't die. He didn't die like Bill. But this, this dude has over 1 million followers on LinkedIn. He is... The only person that I know right now that has like a TV show on LinkedIn is pretty good. It's it's really good. I can't wait till you guys meet uh, Mr. Iman. So I will be back here at 10 p.m. That's Pacific Standard Time. And I'll tell you guys in full disclosure, um, as far as with Iman, I dropped the ball. I dropped the ball on it. And the reason I keep telling you that is because I believe in order to be a leader, in everybody else's life, you got to be a leader in your life and you need to accept responsibility. Um, what happened with Ivan was we were negotiating, we were talking back and forth. And um, I put on there, I think it said EST. So I'm thinking Easter Standard Time, three hours before, uh, three hours before where I'm at. But it's like A E S T or E E S. I think, I think it's like A E S T, which is Australia Easter Standard Time. And uh, he logged into the green room and I'm in the bed. It's like 10 o'clock. And uh, <laughs> and he's like, I guess we're not doing this today. And I'm looking and I'm just like, oh, no, I dropped the ball. It's probably like Monday where he's at. <laughs> but we were a day. Uh, we were a day apart. So but he's going to be here tonight, tonight at 10 p.m. Um, I know what you're thinking. It's late, but don't be like that. Y'all know y'all are up watching those Netflix. I want y'all to come and I want y'all to watch some secrets or get some secrets. Watch the podcast, the broadcast and get some secrets to take home with you, because just like Bill, the things that this guy is doing is incredible and it doesn't have anything to do with the exterior. It all starts from inside, right? That's what inspiration is about. So I'll see y'all tonight.